This is Ralph Rensler, director of the Smithsonian Bicentennial Folklife Festival. If you enjoyed the festival, you'll be interested in this invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, an opportunity like this cannot be taken for granted. This evening, we are going to be beating our hearts out for you all, so I want to see people enjoying themselves. So get up and feel the music and do something about it, okay? This event is a right of cultural democracy. We have many, many partners, you included. I encourage you to stand alongside with us as we travel this journey year after year. Welcome to Sister Fire Song Talk, a part of Beyond the Mall from the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Thank you for joining us. We are offering real-time captioning and American Sign Language interpretation for today's program. To view the simulcast that includes these services, please use the link provided in the comments section. My name is Nicole Barden, and I'll be the story weaver for today's event, which is produced in partnership with Roadwork. If you don't know the festival, I encourage you to check out festival si.edu to learn about our programs, educational resources, and more. In addition, I hope you also go to roadworkcenter.org to learn more about the organization that became known for putting women's culture on the road in the late 70s and through the arts and cultural expression continues to highlight the varied and intersectional experiences of women. During today's program, we'd love to hear from you. 
Please participate by commenting and asking questions in the chat. We are joined live by Martha Gonzalez, Amethyst Kia, and Layla McCalla. And joining by video is Barbara Dang. Through their music, each artist encourages listeners to take a more nuanced view of their lives and the broader society. We encourage you to visit each artist's website or view our chat for additional information about their pioneering and award-winning careers. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Here. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you. Well, we are fortunate to have each artist join us for a song talk. The song talk genre was named by one of Roadworks founders, Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan, and is situated in the congregational call and response um, a space rooted in the black church and the Southern freedom movement that merged song and prose to call people to action. So a song talk is a space for dialogue that prioritizes breaking silences, speaking hard truths, and, survive, and surviving against all odds, all through the use of your voice. We will begin our conversation with words from Barbara Dane, who is a canonical figure in so many genres, including jazz, blues, and folk music. Barbara is known for being on the front lines of various struggles, singing at picket lines in Detroit and freedom schools in Mississippi, peace rallies and international protests throughout the decades. We are delighted to have the following remarks from Barbara Day. Well, hello, I'm Barbara Dane and I'm sitting here in Oakland, California at 93 years old talking to you people all over the world in outer space and cyberspace and whatever space. And you can't imagine what a thrill it is to be together like this. Well, today we're experiencing one of the most dramatic moments in human history with its soundtrack bursting from artists everywhere, ranging from an anguished 12 year old to veteran professionals. People all over the planet are rising up to demand justice and not just for themselves, but for all people. Black Lives Matter, raise the banner. The world has risen up to follow it. We can hear the walls of white supremacy crumbling all around us. And in the distance, we hear the ring of voices calling out the name of the system that built those walls. The young singer-songwriter, Her, in her 2020 masterpiece, I Can't Breathe, tells us clearly racism is not just a part of capitalism, but the very foundation of it. She sings, it's bigger than black or white. It's a problem with the whole way of life. Sarah Ogan Gunning named this sister in the 1930s, a fierce singer from a family of coal miners in Harlan County, Kentucky. She carried her songs to the front lines of the union organizing struggle and flung them into the deputy sheriff's guns. Whenever I sing it to you, I try to take you there and I'm gonna do it now a little bit. I hate the capitalist system. I'll tell you the reason why. It has caused me so much suffering and my dearest friends to die. While the rich and mighty capitalist goes dressed and jewels and silk. My darling blue-eyed baby has died for the want of milk. Well, what they call this the land of plenty. But for them, I guess it's true. For the rich and mighty capitalists, not for workers like me and you. So what can we do about it? To these men of power and might? Uh, I tell you, Mr. Capitalist, we are going to fight Fight, fight. Well, a big part of our job as artists is to help people see through the fog of our warped education, our corrupt media, the insistent commercial persuasions, the false promises of self-serving politicians, the white supremacy brainwashing, and even our own fantasies of either dystopia or utopia. Truth and reality is what we're after. We do the best we can with the tools we have. We bring songs for building unity and solidarity. We give voice to the voiceless. We open the hearts of those frozen in some past narrative that can only lead to the destruction of the planet 
and the disappearance of the whole human race. When you find a great song and you want to make it work for you, sometimes you have to rewrite the words. This song written by Rob Johnson, one of the best British truth singers, is one I couldn't resist. When you hear the word impossible, just remember, Muhammad Ali said this, impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. First we'll tear down the towers and bring back the neighborhoods. Start at the bottom, work down to the top. House all the homeless in the great halls of Congress. Ban all the guns and bust all the bad cops. Be reasonable and demand the impossible now. Uh, uh, uh. No master, no landlord, no boss, no guru, no goal actor, no commissar. Just justice and poetry jam on it too. When they ask who's in charge here, we all say we are. When they ask who's in charge here, we all say we are. Be reasonable and demand the impossible now. Be reasonable and demand the impossible now. In the middle of Brooklyn, New York, there lives a whirlwind of musical energy and love by the name of Beverly Grant. She knows a thing or two about inspiring people to sing, conducting an all-women's labor chorus for the last 40 years, which you can join without even auditioning. She's always writing new songs. People need to inspire them and always there to sing them when they need them. One of her best is the one I'll leave with you with. from the smallest seed if its roots are planted firmly in the ground go on reach for the sun only then we'll know all the love all the beauty all the justice rain and down Thank you, Barbara. You know, we'll now bring up all of the artists um, to join in a dialogue. And Barbara really um, set us up well for this first question. She mentioned, you know, the artist's role is to help people see through the fog. So I want to pose to all of you, how do you use your music to uh, get people's attention and then to inspire action? Who's going first? <laughs> Go ahead, Leila. Go ahead. Um, well, I think for me, uh, so much of my passion for making music comes from uh, exploring history, exploring stories. And I think that uh, narrative is such a big part of uh, helping people to see their own hearts and to feel empathy. Um, I think not sympathy, uh, empathy, because uh, sympathy is just kind of, you know, there's a helplessness to, to sympathy um, where you don't feel inspired to make change. I think empathy is when you can feel someone's pain and you can start to imagine um, a different way for things to be. Um, so yeah, for me, it be begins with, exploring songs that tell stories that touch people's hearts, which sounds very um, basic, but <laughs> um, you know, my, my family's from Haiti. And, um, and so I'm singing a, a lot of the time in Creole and 
thinking a lot about Haitian history, its relationship to the United States. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot to explore there. Um, but if we don't, you know, see ourselves in, in, in someone else's shoes, um, I think it's harder to make change happen. Beautiful, great, great point. I think along the same lines of, of what Leila is saying, um, in my case as, as well, um, I'm not really, um, I think people inspire us, inspire mm -hmm. me, and all of these movements that, um, that I've been a part of uh, have inspired me uh, to write, right? The, the lyrics that I write, the melodies that I come up with, uh, mm -hmm. the communities I'm involved in really are the ones that inform the music I, I, I play um, and that we play as a band in Quetzal. And uh, um, so I think that we're just sort of a mirror to what uh, we reflect some of these ideas, the hopes and aspirations that our communities have, the visions that they have for the future, um, the ways and what the things we need to pay attention to, you know, um, these are the things that I think that um, we do as well as songwriters. Um, uh, so they're giving me the fuel and then I, I project um, and then I think it's wonderful when the community itself says, I love that song because it reminds me of, right, when really it comes from them. Well, for me, um, for a long time, music, whether I was listening to it or writing it, um, I was using music to save myself for a very long time. Um, and a big part of that had to do with growing up in white suburbia. And as I got older, starting to, starting to feel um, the kind of more covert but still obvious, um, I guess, rejection that I would get from uh, white peers. Um, and then on top of that, uh, you know, my my parents who up until this point, you know, I, I was want, I didn't have anything that I didn't, um, I didn't have anything that, I wasn't want for anything, I guess you put it that way. Um, I, you know, had anything I could ever dream of, but um, my parents' marriage started to, you know, um, started to kind of fall apart. And while they were kind of figuring that out, I sort of emotionally removed myself because the things that I was experiencing in school and how I was feeling about myself and about my own image um, and about my blackness and what that even was, um, I turned to music. And so for a very long time, um, I listened to music that was reflecting how I was feeling so that I would feel less alone. Um, so, you know, fast forward to now, you know, from my teenagers all the way up into, you know, my, in my twenties and now, um, I didn't really start writing songs, looking at the external effects of why I felt the way I felt growing up. And it started with the transatlantic slave trade. And mm -hmm. when, so my first time ever writing music that was directly addressing those things, because for a long time, I, I, I studied about these things. I knew about it. I studied old time music. I learned about the commercial music industry, how it started, how it was segregated, how it further divided us um, and attaching our racial identity to music. And I knew all of these things, but I was, fear was keeping me from really speaking about them openly or even writing music, addressing why that was. And being in Our Native Daughters with Layla and Rhiannon and Allison Russell, um, that was my moment where I finally felt comfortable because I was around other black <laughs> women who experienced like just such similar experiences and it allowed me to really dive in and have the courage to be like, okay, 
I, I want, I want to do this, you know? And even then I was still kind of scared, but once we met and we started talking about our experiences and really was digging more into like this history, um, you know, I finally had the the courage to be able to move forward. So writing about these kinds of things and being open about these things and my feelings and thoughts on them um, is, is new for me. And um, now I'm just, I'm here to try to to continue that momentum and um, you know and kind of just see what next. A lot of the newer songs that I'm writing are now more about talking more about um, the things that are going on as opposed to only focusing on my own feelings and how and what I was dealing with, which all those things are important because I'm part of the story. I'm part of history um, mm -hmm. as we all are, but um, but now I'm in a place where I'm starting to heal from, uh, from the things that I was dealing with and experiencing. And now I'm able to look up from the ground and look at what's happening and, um, start speaking truth to power. So, um, yeah, but if it wasn't for our native daughters, I, you know, I don't know, I guess it would have happened eventually, <laughs> but that was really, that really set the groundwork for me. So, yeah. Well, just so everyone knows, we will hear um, a song from our native daughters a little later on um, from that album. Um, but it seems like what you all have mentioned is that, um, you know, inspiring other people is also a part of, you know, being inspired yourself, right? Whether that's Martha from your point around hearing music, you know, writing songs based on what you're hearing from the community or Amethyst, your point around, um, you know, part of this is also a journey that you're on, right? Um, and this whole using music to inspire others is also a form of being inspired yourself and, and working through different things. Um, and I, I think that that is a, a really strong um, segue, Layla, to Song of the Dark Girl, just in terms of focusing on that personal narrative and something having something that's so gripping. Um, yeah. I don't know if you wanna say anything so before you um play but yeah yeah um so this is a song from my first album which was um released in tribute to langston hughes and for me um you know where i was at when i was putting these songs together is i was trying to find my own voice um and um, i found a lot of solace and inspiration from the poetry of langston hughes and i started setting some of his poems to songs and um, many artists have done this before, um, but I feel his his words um, kind of speak to the heart of um, the heart of any matter that is being discussed um, in such a in such a, a simple and plain and digestible way and um, and his and his words are so musical. So this is um, a song that he. Well, this is a poem that he wrote called Song for a Dark Girl. And, um, you know, it, it makes me think of um, how this issue, you know, it just in the past couple of weeks, I think there were seven, seven black men found lynched um, and all ruled suicides, which I find highly, highly suspicious. So, um, you know, I, I also just want to emphasize that this is, not the past, you know, the past is not the past. The past is with us all the time. And, and uh, until we truly reckon with it, I don't think that um, we can heal properly, but anyway. the heart of me they hung my black young lover to a crossroads tree way down south in Dixie whose body high in the air I asked the white Lord Jesus what was the use of prayer 
Way down south in Dixie Break the heart of me Love is a naked shadow On an all the naked tree Way down south in Dixie, break the heart of me. They hung my black young lover to a crossroads tree. Way down south in Dixie, bruised body high in the air. I asked the white lord. Jesus, what was the use of prayer? Way down south in Dixie, break the heart of me. Love is a naked shadow on an old and naked tree. Love is a naked shadow on an old and naked tree. Love is a naked shadow on an old and naked tree. When I when I first heard that song, um, it was definitely something that was a call to action for me, just in terms of it, the simplicity of the lyrics and the directness of them. Um, really just just halt you in place, right? Um, yeah. Which is a testament to Langston Hughes' poetry and his writing. But then I think when you have the music accompany it as well, it, it adds another dimension to it, which um, is in one way unsettling, right? When I hear the lyrics and the song, and then in, in another way, to your point, you're reminded of the recent stories about yeah. um, about this activity. Yeah. I think there's also like, you know, in speaking to how do you create change, people have to feel that yeah. halted, arrested right. feeling, you know? Um, you have exactly. to feel it in your gut that something is something is terribly off <laughs> and exactly. we need to fix it, you know? That's what creates the urgency. Um, and, you know, we're looking at uh, George Floyd videos, you know, which honestly has been very difficult for me to even bring myself to look at the video because it's so, um, in some ways has been so sensationalized. So I have my own internal sort of conflict with that feeling. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, there are certain moments that if people don't see them, then they don't feel something, right. you know, so it's right. like, everyone being trapped in their houses and trying to do the right thing for each other, but seeing that the system is, is broken and that the system is not doing the right thing for us um, has, has motivated a lot of action that we're seeing right now. So true. Um, Martha, we have you also on the screen and I don't know if there's any, any, I mean, there's so much <laughs> that you could respond to there. Um, but, for me, it was interesting kind of listening to Layla's song as well as thinking about El Rio and thinking about the conversation that those songs have in terms of um, El Rio was a bit of a an anthem, something that, you know, once focusing on these personal narratives that are deeply touching and deeply moving, um, that you then also have a connection to kind of this larger picture around um, movements and struggles. and and it got me, it, it moved me from the place of reflection and thinking, okay, what to do? And it moved me to a place of, well, who can I work with and where can we go and what can we do to address some of these issues? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there in case you have any other comments that you wanted to add. Uh, no, I, I totally agree with how you're framing it. Uh, for me, it's really, um, it's a, uh, been really important for us to, in these times um, and in the quarantine and what we were seeing, to really go back to those tools that we've always had, the culture, culture, 
um, uh, the music, um, the relationships that we had built in, in social movement spaces. Um, um, you know, these things we have in our toolbox as a, a, a um, an elder in our community has said, you know, of healing, of things oh. to go back to when uh, the world isn't right. And, um, you know, we've, in a way, we've been building community in order to be ready for these moments. And this is when, uh, so when the government fails, you have those grassroots uh, connections that you can go back to, the skill sets that you've developed over time. And, um, and of course, to your family, right? To wh who you, what, who and what you call family. And, um, you know, that's what pretty much El Rio is about um, for us to look at how the swell of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy um, coming from the greatest, from the leaders way at the top um, to all the different levels of government, um, the violence that they continue to inflict on uh, um, uh, black, brown, queer, trans bodies and uh you know, and how um, we have the skill sets to keep challenging it. So it's really the metaphor of the Rio is that it rises and uh, we know how to how to surf that Rio, uh, how to surf that that current that is coming at us. And we f we find ways we have the skill sets. It's sort of a reminder that we have the skill sets and the tools and the communities that it takes uh -huh. to keep pushing back. That's so true. So true. Um, would you like to share El Rio with us? Sure. Um, I just recognize that that my my partner Quetzal Flores and my son, 15 year old son uh, Sandino, it will be joining me, and they're um, part of how we um, practice and uh, you know thrive here at home. Um, this is a family practice. Here we go. <laughs>
Fantastic, Martha. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was I was over here dancing in my seat, but <laughs> no one could see that. <laughs> um, that that was. It's just I don't know. It's the feeling of the song. I mean, and I've seen you. I've seen videos of you perform the song where there's also the dancing component, right? The way your body moves. That it's it's a whole body experience. Um, so. Yes, the zapateado as um, this genre that we're borrowing from to write the original music here is uh, is uh, the son jarocho, which has the um, the African roots, the indigenous roots of Mexico, as well as the Andalusia and the, the, the sort of like the um, roots of from Spain, the area of Spain. But um, and uh, together, you know, the 400 plus year old tradition that has all of this polyrhythms and like uh -huh. uh, the body and the, the percussive work that happens on the tarima is very much, uh, um, you know, manifested in uh, all of these rhythms. So anyhow, I, I love to dance, but it would be too <laughs> crazy right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we have begun to talk about, um, you know, how music inspires action and also our present situation. And so we want to hone in a little more on what's happening today. Um, you know, all 50 states have seen a protest in support of Black Lives um, and calling out police brutality. Um, you know, the Pew just put out a survey that said about 70% of Americans support Black Lives Matter. Um, and then we also have the city council in Minneapolis saying, we're gonna, we're gonna dismantle our, our current police department and radically rethink what should what should uh, be built in its place and how we can keep communities safe, which probably an hour before they announced that would have been viewed as being impossible, right? Um, so it also makes me think about, you know, and Barbara Dane mentions in her clip, you know, be reasonable, demand the impossible now, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you can't get people outside of thinking about, well, the, the box that we're in without putting some things on the table that force people to radically rethink what's going on. Um, so given that there's been so much conversation about, um, you know, is this moment like previous, what's happened in previous decades, previous movements, um, I wanted to get you all's take on what you feel you have to offer this moment in particular related to protest and movement building. Um, and as you all uh, continue to reflect on that, we're going to play um, a quote, um, excuse me, a segment um, from a gathering of Harry Belafonte, Bernice Johnson Regan, Holly Near, and Pete Seeger, which I believe is the only time all four of them shared a common stage. So this is um, this is pretty great uh, footage that we have to show you. Um, and also, I hope you all notice um, the late Dr. Shirley Childress in the Dr. Shirley Childress oh, Johnson in the clip. Yeah. Um, Shirley was a longtime member of Sweet Honey in the Rock and um, is thought to be the first certified uh, black ASL interpreter um, so in, in the country. Um, so be sure to check out the chat for more information about the upcoming documentary on Shirley and her pioneering work, and we'll play the, the clip now.
the only dynamic that gives us any chance of being able to compete. The imperial thrust is the dynamic of culture. Culture is the only force, because in culture you can only bring tongue to articulate thought and passion. But culture can also translate morality. Let it I mean, I, when I heard Harry's quote, um, I, it, it, I was just like, well, he said it. <laughs> that, that's mm -hmm. it. Um, what more can you say um, about the role of culture, right? Um, and intertwining the piece around morality into the work. Um, and there have been a lot of recent calls around um, looking at issues as being moral issues, not just um, potentially eco economic issues or, or what have you but looking at the morality component of it. So I'll, I'll pause there and pose the question, um, what do you feel you have to offer in this particular moment of, of social activity and social movement? Well, like, we, like all of us are doing here today is answering calls like these today, right? to come and share our, and uh, speak uh, more at length about our music. I think that for me, it's a real honor to be in this space of historic space, sister um, fire talk and like song talk. And uh, because, um, you know, black women have been at the center of really pushing for so many of us, including Latina bodies um, and, and Latina women you know, in the, in the movement. I think that uh, for us, um, for me, it's a real honor to, to be here and to be able to continue to share the work, to, to be inspired by, um, you know, Native Daughters, all the work that I've heard, um, and just to stay connected to these spaces, you know, to continue to do the work it takes. And, um, and all I can offer is my, um, the work that I do, the work that I've been doing, uh, go back and look at some of the old work, keep offering it up, and, uh, and more than anything, be a good listener. Uh, uh. I think um, for me, it's, it's also uh, doing the work on myself, you know, so that I can continue to, to heal, that I can continue to see, um, you know, life as it, as it can be. I continue to dream, continue to be inspired, um, to raise my children in a way that makes them, you know, conscious and uh, conscientious. And, um, you know, and I think that that is, honestly, I think in the time of the COVID reality, that has really been drawn home because uh -huh. I'm not on the road um, distracted by my schedule and the, and the you know, the hustle uh -huh. that I'm chasing. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm at home with my kids, changing diapers, <laughs> waking up at night, they're not knowing if they're going back to school. And I'm realizing I am That's the a school. Too. I've always yeah. been the school. You know, it's just our, our capitalist system has made me think that, uh, that you know, um, that there is all this separation. And of course, we need community. You know, we need other people. You know, my, my heart hurts, especially for my, my five and a half year old who's um, missing her friends and trying to understand this reality. But um, ultimately, I think that there's uh, a lot of teachable moments here on the personal front. Um, you know, what I think for me, a lot of what is coming up with the, um, you know, with Black Lives Matter suddenly being such a mainstream concept um, it's, a, it's a shame that yeah. it's taken this long, but it's also a, such an incredible moment. Um, uh, I, I think that I have been thinking a lot about the, um, the ways in which I have 
you know, internalized racism myself, you know, as a black woman, the ways that I have, you know, not given myself enough credit, the ways that I have torn myself down. Um, and for me, music has been the ultimate healer. It has been the, the light. Um, and so I've just, you know, once I decided that I wanted to be a musician, I've, I've held on to that light and it has literally saved me. But, um, you know, I think that the, the work, I think recognizing that the work never stops, that it's not like you go to this space and then you, you're, you've arrived, you know? Um, the work will never stop. We're always gonna have to keep on fighting. We're always gonna have to keep on healing. We're always gonna have to keep on, you know, educating ourselves and agitating the, the social, you know, uh, the status quo and, and organizing ourselves to, to, to advocate continually. Yeah, I um, think for me, I'd say the biggest thing, I guess that I've really, I've had, obviously, as Layla was saying, you know, we're, we're at home, we're not gigging and you know, I pretty much, I was centering my entire um, identity around being a gigging musician. And um, I didn't realize that's what I was doing. I don't, I don't, I think most of us don't necessarily realize that we're, you know, regardless of what industry you're in, that some of us just, it's because it's, we end up living and breathing it um, for a variety of reasons. There's the passion for it. Um, but being at home, it's kind of, I've had to like, kind of face myself mm. and really think about, you know, who am I and what do I want? Um, Cause when the gigging was gone, it's like, I, you know, it, it really hit me. I'm like, I've really tied my identity around this and I have a lot more to offer than just being a gigging musician because as I mentioned earlier, you know, I had a, a significant period of time where I had put up these walls and I was keeping people at a distance to protect myself and um, not fully, um, not being fully, not being fully present with myself, um, still using music as a healer, still enjoying engaging with audiences as far as playing music and, um, under, and having that, you know, relationship, but also, you know, again, having the courage to be able to, you know, to go to, to not shut up and sing, if you will, uh, to actually <laughs> go to go beyond and really see my role as an artist. Like, you know, how do I making the decision to be a performer, to be an artist and to have um, to have a gift to be able to take situations and strip them down and make them express them in a way that other people can immediately relate, whether it's uh, another queer black woman or a 40 year old middle-class white woman. I remember I was playing a show in uh, Scotland. I think it was in, I think it was in Glasgow. And a woman came up to me after my performance and she said, you know, I'm a 60 year old middle-class white woman from Scotland, but every single word that came out of your mouth, I felt it and I, 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 it resonated. And I appreciate you so much for doing what you do. And that's something that I've heard from a lot of different people from so many different intersections. So, you know, now I feel like as a time where I've really um, realized and decided that like, you know, my role as a musician, there are two diff there are two, well, I don't I don't want to make it that dichotomous, but just for the sake of this, there are two two things I can do. I can make music and not go beyond that and not talk about these topics and talk about my experiences and just kind of allow the privilege that I do have to shield me from having to really comment on anything. I can just be a musician, write songs about, you know, 
not hard, not difficult topics and then keep going. Or I can realize that my position is to be able to, as Robert Dane said, help people see through the fog. And I feel like because of my experiences, because of my background and what I've experienced and knowing how much music has healed me and how I've been able to heal other people through music, um, I feel like it's my personal, it's, it's a personal responsibility to um, take it beyond that. And um, again, I, I think it's really fascinating also that racism is now you, you, you go on Netflix, you go on YouTube, you go on any like streaming service. And it's like, here is an entire library of mm -hmm. documentaries about these issues. And I'm like, wow, it, that's great. I mean, like, I, I mean, like this has been happening for a very long time. And I'm, I'm on one hand, it's kind of like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's, it's an interesting little, I guess, slight internal conflict. Cause you know, I'd like to think that the people in these companies beyond obviously making money, which is, you know, why they are successful is they make, they make money doing what they do. But that there is um, that there is some positive intent there beyond just making money. I mean, I'm sure there's probably different layers of that within. But the what I sort of I guess resonated myself, or I kind of the conclusion I came to is that regardless of what their intent was, I'm uh -huh. seeing real real change as far as people being like, oh my god, I've never thought of this perspective. You know, and so yeah. anyway, I, I, yeah, I just feel like as an artist, yeah, I, I feel like as an artist now, it's, it's with, with all of our experiences, it's really important to, to take a step beyond and really, you know, um, yeah, say what needs to be said to be able to make things better. So, well, well, Amethyst, um, I think you've teed yourself up here. Um, are you, are you, um, I don't know that we can introduce you any better, uh, but are you ready to share fire water? Oh yes, definitely. Okay. So this is the song that it was probably right before the time I really started to, I guess, heal in a lot of ways. Um, and this is about a, a time when I was starting to turn to like going out and partying to kind of, you know, ignore my problems and the world's problems and all of that. And so this is me on the other side of that looking back and really seeing, seeing it the moment for what it actually was, so. Spirit, and I'm still laying here crying on the floor, on the floor. So, can you just leave me be? Being drenched in fire, water won't save me. I'll forsake the path of filth, please. Can you just be? Pensive stands are the only 
crowns I've ever gleaned. So in the dark, I find the answers that I need. City lights are the only stars I ever see. How many nights until I finally can breathe? How many spirits does it take to lift a spirit? I don't know. I don't know. Cause I bought every spirit and I'm still laying here crying on the floor. On the So can you just leave me be? Being drenched in fire, water won't save me. I'll forsake the path of filth and thieves. Can you just leave? Can you just leave? Can you just leave? me be thank you and this is and we'll thank go, you. yeah of course and we'll go directly into martha um into justice never dies Beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Such a fan. Uh, that's gorgeous. Just um, so we're we're just gonna go straight into the next song, Nicole. Okay. <laughs> well, this song is a uh, it's um in realizing the madness that was happening outside our windows, uh, being in the quarantine and then seeing the protests. We joined one or two protests out there, but mainly try to really sit stay put and do what we could um you begin to realize that then you know your in your immediate family um oftentimes is what gives you a lot of strength and so but this is a microcosm and a look into the kind of hope that happens that can still thrive in in the privacy of your own home but it can also translate into the larger world and as um as the world that we're seeing is dying uh, but we also have to remember that we can, um, we have the strength and the power collectively to create a new world, right? So that's what this, it's like a, an oldies style love song.
dust has settled Open your eyes, we're still alive Some evaporated, lost hope Gave up or just went blind But we can see and look Everything we built is intact The way we love and celebrate The way we laugh As we rebuild the world around us As others still fight and die We keep doing all we can We don't just survive We want to thrive That was so beautiful, Martha. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we are coming up on a, about the last 10 minutes that we have to share together. Um, and so Darn. we want, I know, it, it's moving so fast. <laughs> uh, but we've had such great conversation. Um, and so we are going to um, share a clip again from the gathering with Harry Belafonte, uh, Pete Seeger, Holly Near, and Bernice Johnson-Regan, uh, which I think will, will set us up for our last set of performances and some final thoughts. I talk now about the danger of silence in a democracy in almost every concert and talk about the fact that it, people are too quiet and that they have to talk about what they are thinking everywhere. And then we sing songs around it and songs that say no. And when people sing the song, they put in the song almost like an end to the silence. And uh, so we do a lot of go to lay down my sword and shield down, down by the river way down by the river way down by the river side go to lay down my sword and shield way down by the river side ain't gonna study And I think Bernice's focus on democracy, right, and particularly the importance of speaking in a democracy is really poignant, especially, you know, in, in these times. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I just wanted to say that um, um, in thinking about our, uh, uh, the fact that, you know, um, capitalism, patriarchy permeates every structure in our system. I think it's also very, very important for us to be aware that it can also, um, it has created um, um, a system where we, we, um, we can't forget that 
even capitalism can take something like revolution, right, or democracy, and uh, um, sort of um, and sell that, right, uh, without substance, uh, with their own definitions, and we have to make sure that we keep redefining, and we keep challenging this, right, to be always weary of this system, right, um, and create, continue to create those community spaces that Bernice Johnson Regan created and continues to remind us of, like this Sister Fire song talks, right? So that exactly. we can keep talking through these things. So true. So as we think about this time that we are sharing together this last hour, um, how do you think that, that will impact your, um, your, the way you think about the connection between your work and activism, or organizing, or its connection to social movements? I really, um, I, um, I, in the last, um, I would say, because of an experience um, that we experienced in Chiapas, Mexico, with rebel Mayan Zapatistas in the mountains of Chiapas, they really got us thinking about how capitalism permeates everything, right? And one of the things is socially, in terms of music, right, I was building my entire career thinking about myself just as a musician on the stage, mm. because that's the only example I ever really had, right? Um, capitalism makes us think that, you know, the grassroots uh, community sort of music making processes are irrelevant or backwards or country bumpkin like, right? Uh. And so it took something like a fandango, for example, uh, participatory music and dance practice native to the state of Veracruz and being part of this transnational fandango movement in the U.S. right now that really, um, and the Zapatista teachings that really got me thinking about, wait a minute, being a professional performer is really important that we do important work as well, right? We write songs, we inspire other people, we people, whoever enjoys our music, we're very grateful for it. Uh -huh. And we, it's good to create political music and, and, and music that gets people thinking, right? And, but it's still part of the system. And I think we also need to use our skill sets, find ways of engaging communities on a more grassroots level and really uh, using our skill sets to also develop and strengthen community spaces so that we can jam, so that can we be in community, because that also inspires critical thought, critical participation, the things that we need to continue to connect to each other so that we can imagine this new world that, because this old other one is dying. So what are we gonna do with the new one? We have to have these dialogues. It doesn't have to be supersized, right? It, it could be these local communities, the silos that connect to other spaces, that connect to beyond and, and right? But we need to also use our skill sets as musicians to also do that work. I think that would be, that's also really important because it sort of removes us from capitalist frameworks that are also can corrupt us as well, right? No uh -huh. matter how, no matter how um, um, honest our work is, I think it's all, it can also be a very, um, it's corrupt, it could corrupt us as well. So uh -huh. to stay connected to community or community spaces is really important and engage in those ways, I think is, are, is also part of our new responsibilities. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's been, uh, you know, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. Right now I'm, I'm visiting family in Georgia. But um, yeah, it's been amazing to feel um, the, the mutual aid that has cropped up, you know, from the coronavirus epidemic, um, people starting their own gardens. Uh, finding ways of, you know, realizing that we need ways of sustainability um, and that, you know, that that should extend this beyond this crisis time. Um, and, yeah, the energy in the streets during the protests has been incredible to be a part of. Um, the leaders, you know, I, I, one of the things that really stood out to me um, at the, the, I went to a protest uh, a couple of Fridays ago, and it was um, there's an organization called Take Them Down NOLA that has sort of kickstarted a lot of the you know taking down uh, monuments to the Confederacy throughout the South. And ironically, New Orleans is now dragging its heels, and we're seeing all these <laughs> Confederate monuments coming wow. down in all these other cities, but we're still fighting in our own city for the city council to make, you know, uh, decisions for the way forward. And, you know, 
these activists, one, one of them was saying, you know, uh, but one of the slogans was, we can't get no satisfaction until we take down Andrew Jackson. And you know, <laughs> that his days are numbered. And it's just so clear who's on the right and wrong sides of history now. It's becoming less and less debatable. So it's, it's really just a matter of time and that we're gonna do it, you know, whether we have the approval of the authorities or not, it's coming down. And then another thing that a, another activist and uh, community organizer said is, you know, there's no difference between me as a community organizer and you. The, o the only difference is discipline and, and practice. You just keep on showing up, you know? You keep on showing up for each other. You keep on showing up for your for what you believe in. You become involved in your, your city council. You become involved in, uh -huh. you know, whatever movement and you just keep on showing up and you don't have to, you know, none of these community organizers have superhero powers. They have voices and you just become less and less fearless. And I, I really, uh, that stayed with me. That's keep fantastic. On, keep Just on keep showing, showing up. up. That keep is, on showing up and stop thinking that, that you have to be some kind of superhero to create, you know, create systemic change. Uh -huh. Create it now. Create it in this moment, you know. But that's similar to what we were talking about before, right? Where right. today, what, what can you offer today is to keep doing what I was doing yesterday, maybe do a little more of it but just to keep going, right? And right. keep doing it and just keep showing up. Yeah. Um, well, Layla, um, would you mind sharing um, your last song with us? Sure. A Day for the Hunter, A Day for the Prey? Yeah, so this is uh, the title track to my second record. And um, that title comes from a Haitian proverb. I mentioned uh -huh. earlier that my family uh -huh. is from Haiti and it's a big part of my inspiration. I, I'm not really singing in Creole today, but um, it's a big part of my work. Um, but I think even more a part of my work is a big part of my perspective on the world, learning about Haitian history. And so when I wrote this song, I was learning about a songwriting tradition that emerged from um, the refugee crises of the 80s and 90s um, from, you know, Haitian boat people, uh, people who were fleeing Haiti, political persecution and, and violence. Um, to come to the United States. And of course, we know that that's an incredibly treacherous path. But when the album came out and the song was released, there was so much in the news about um, the same journey from Syria across the Mediterranean. And um, when I'm singing these words today, I, I want to, I'm singing them to make sure that we don't forget that people are still being detained for seeking asylum in the United yeah. States. Seeking asylum is not a crime. And, um, and a lot of people have been, you know, separated from their children, separated from their parents. Um, there's sexual abuse cases. There's uh, massive, massive violations of human rights. And um, we can't stop talking about it because we're in our houses watching Netflix. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so day for the hunter, day for the prey. I'm gonna try to work my... headphone situation. <laughs> if I go away, I want you to pray not for me. For the souls who have gone away before If I am to stay I want you to pray Not for me For the souls who have stayed like me before Day for the hunter, day for the prey Day for the hunter, day for the prey. Day for the hunter, day for the prey. Day for the hunter, day for the prey. Day 
If they take me away, I want you to pray, not for me, for the souls who have been taken like me before. If I understand, I want you to pray, not for me, for the souls who have stayed like me before. Day for the hunter, day for the prey. 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 Thank you, Ayla. That was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> um, Amethyst, um, I, I feel like this is a great, just the juxtaposition, talking about a day for the hunter, a day for the prey. And there's so much you could, there's so much analysis you could do just with that phrase alone, right? Um, but then shifting to a conversation um, or shifting to Black Myself, um, I think is a great anthem. Uh, and for me, it's, it, it's been great to play. <laughs> and just, um, just be energized by it. So um, would you like to follow up on the question that we posed to the group and then play Black Myself? Yes. Um, well, I think the way that this dialogue has kind of helped me think about what more I can do. And of course, leading up to this, I've, you know, again, been thinking a lot about about this and becoming more involved and being more, um, being able to use my platform as a musician to bring attention to issues. Um, and this is a very like practical, this is a very like kind of practical thing, but like I need to be, um, I have done the thing that a lot of people do, which is I focus on the main election, the presidential election, and I'm not as closely mm -hmm. following my local representatives. That mm -hmm. is, not a good thing on my part and that's something that I that I'm I'm changing that I've started to change already so um because like all of, you know all of this is connected and we can't just look at one section and then be like okay now everything's solved um like when Obama was elected president oh racism is gone now because we have a black president and it's like you know we, we've seen the backlash uh, wow. we've seen, you know I mean it's obviously that is clearly a, you know a ridiculous notion so um, you know, it starts, it starts local, it starts from the ground up. So that's a mentality that I, that I have in my mind now going forward, um, to uh, do that. So uh, that's, yeah, so that's, that, that's just as big as writing songs. I also need to continue to understand and keep my eye on what's going on, you know, in my, in my own area too. So that is, um, something I want to do that I will be doing moving forward. So, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on in Johnson City. <laughs> All right, exactly. Yes, there is. There definitely okay. is, um, for Great. sure. Yeah. Great. So, but yeah, I think um, you want me. I can go ahead and segue into Black Myself. Yeah, sure, sure. sure. Um, yeah. Well, this was the the first track off of Songs for Native Daughters. A lot of you um, have probably already 
um, listen to the record and thank you so much for that. This is um, it's just amazing to be able to, um, you know, for all of us to have been able to write these songs and have them received so well and take us to places we um, could only dream of. So, um, so thanks so much for all the love and support. Um, I guess I won't go through the introduction on this song because I think it's pretty, <laughs> it's gonna be pretty evident when I sing. Um, it's a little different. Sometimes when I'm playing at certain places, I do have to give a little bit of an exposition, but I think, uh, I think you all know what's up. So here's Black Myself. Martha, Layla, and Barbara. Um, yeah. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, Everyone's kind of beautiful. This is, this is great. <laughs> this is great. Um, and thank all of you for joining us and being a part of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival Beyond the Mall. After today, the festival's digital programs will continue with weekly conversations, demonstrations, and performances. Be sure to check out festival.si.edu but you'll find a schedule of events as well as a treasure trove of articles, recipes, photographs, and videos from past festivals. Here's hoping that next year we'll gather on the National Mall and beyond. To learn more about Sister Fire and Roadwork, I encourage you to visit us at roadworkcenter.org. 
I would like to close by offering thanks to the Roadwork Board, advisors, interns, and friends. I also want to thank the entire Folklife Festival team, especially Alexander Taggart, along with all of the staff, interns, and volunteers for collaborating once again with Roadwork. Although this year we're not on the National Mall, today's program proves that the spirit of the festival lives on. We will close this event with the Resistance Revival Chorus's performance of Ella's song, a song written by Bernice Johnson Regan, based on Ella Baker's teachings as a civil rights activist and trainer. Thank you all for joining us. Hi. <laughs> We all believe in freedom cannot rest. Mm. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Freedom cannot rest. Mm. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Just one and the number